Hi, my name is Karen Patterson, and I am the curator and director of exhibitions here at the Fabric Workshop. And right now we are in the archives of the Fabric Workshop, right next to artist boxes, because we're talking about unpacking our stories and looking into the various elements found in these artist boxes that might give us clues to how this artisan residency went forward. In each of these boxes, we can see swatches of materials, exchanges between the studio coordinator and the artist in the residence, and other hints and clues about some of the intricacies of a residency with the fabric workshop. And now, with Unpacking Our Stories, we're bringing those stories to life with conversations with either the artist in residence or the estate that represents the artist, the past studio coordinator, and some current scholars, curators, thinkers of all kinds that can help illuminate the impact of this residency on art history and our current ways of thinking. This episode focuses on Toshiko Takeizu, who was in residence with the Fabric Workshop from 1989 until 1991. And this conversation takes place between Christina Roberts, who is our Director of Education, but was the studio coordinator with Toshiko in 1989, and it was her first project in which she collaborated with an artist in residence. We'll also be joined by Elisa Alexander, who is the assistant curator at the Cantor in California, and she will be talking a little bit more about Asian American artists and the archive that she's working with at Stanford. And then we'll also be joined with Shino Takeda, who was in the exhibition hardcover with works by Toshiko Takeizu. Shino is a ceramicist in New York City, and they both talk a lot about how hosting and thinking about food and dinners and ceramics all play a part in their understanding of their own art practice. This episode opens with Christina talking a little bit about the project and then ends with current documentation of Toshiko Takeizu's home in New Jersey. When Fabric Workshop and Museum Curator Karen Patterson saw Toshiko Takeizu's Soft Moon edition in our archives, she started putting together initial ideas for the exhibition hardcover, which is on view now this summer in 2021. And we'll be unpacking Toshiko Takeizu today. Her residency at the Fabric Workshop spanned three years between 1989 through 1992. Toshiko's ceramic moon balls paired with the soft moons, an addition created during her residency, is being exhibited for the first time. At the fabric workshop, um, Toshiko was uh, recommended to do a residency by her longtime friend Lenore Tani, pictured on the right with Jack Leonard Larson. So Toshiko was really no stranger to textiles in the textile world. So she happily accepted the invitation to become a resident at the fabric workshop in the in the summer of 1989 and when she accepted her invitation it was a humbling excuse me i'll start over again it was a honor and a humbling experience to work with one of the 20th century's greatest abstract artists this is a, a short video clip that I'll show. It has terrible sound, but it's nice to see Toshiko, and she's really laying out the groundwork for her residency. She brought with her some prints that she had made at Penland um, back in the, I think, 50s. And she's sort of talking about the screen printing um, process or like the possibilities. And she's talking with our late and founding artistic director, Marion Stroud. I like that one because you can make a whole, whole thing. And nothing is definite, but it's definite. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. But I like well, the round sculpture anyway. They're cutting out as many as they can, and then we can lay them on one table, and you can okay. lay them out okay. so that we can shoot a screen for you. OK. Now, but the thing is, um, that's right, the same one, the same screen can move. 
back and forth and over that. So that's going to be the tricky part of it, but that's going to be the fun part also. At the workshop, we have a unique um, collection of artist boxes that we keep in our archives, which contain the prototypes and notes and samples and ephemera marking the collaborative and experimental process of the artist's residency. We'll take a look at some of the samples to give you a deep appreciation of Puerto Chico's residency, which was highly experimental and not a hurried affair. Her residency was uh, three over three years. I think Toshiko really enjoyed coming to the workshop and being around people and printing and fabric, and it gave her a, a new new possibilities to explore in her work. So on that first day, Kippy and, and Toshiko are kind of talking about the prints and how the circles could move back and forth. And these are some of the experimental prints that behind the scenes, uh, Kippy and Toshiko were talking, but the printers were busy exposing screens and mixing color. And we were um, busily printing some of the, uh, trying to print on fabric, um, what she had made at, at um, Penland. And these are some of the experiments. And instead of creating motion through her painterly gestural mark making, she created a sense of movement through layering circle shapes over one another. We understood after learning about Toshiko's work that she was very drawn, drawn to the raw form. So I worked with the construction, uh, excuse me. <laughs> I worked with the construction technicians, Cassandra Lozano and Duena Adam to create a soft round sculptural form in various sizes. And we initially acqui acquired the form, deconstructing a plastic beach ball to get the, the pattern shape and tracing the pieces. We created a series of prototypes to experiment with on her next visit, which Toshiko really loved. And here she is painting with um, pigments on fabric and painting on the just the blank prototypes. And this is the finished edition of Soft Moon, a set of five soft sculptures printed with textile ink on Belgian linen. After graduate school, Toshiko traveled to Japan to study Zen Buddhism and techniques in traditional Japanese pottery, which influenced her work. Toshiko treated life with wholeness and oneness with nature. And everything she did was to improve and discover herself. Toshiko used the endless circle motif in her work, referencing Zen Buddhism concept, which represents cyclical nature of birth, death, and rebirth. This is a short video. You can watch how steady Toshiko's hand is in drawing the endless circle. We made a, a yardage out of the endless circle fabric design and we constructed several prototypes using it. This is um, a prototypes for moon balls. And this was a drapable moon coat that we made. And this is another prototype that came from that same endless circle yardage. And the coat came from Toshiko's handwoven garment collection. This set of color samples is from Toshiko's artist, artist box and it kind of takes me down memory lane thinking about a trip that we took to her home in Quakertown, New Jersey, um, where we saw her um, vegetable garden with heirloom vegetables and she cooked us this amazing dinner and her sense of hospitality was just incredible and those were truly the cherished moments working at the fabric workshop. So inside her studio you can see her um, ceramic works, but she's working on a, a blank mylar using the frottage technique. And we thought it would be interesting for her to kind of capture the texture of her ceramics. So she and her apprentices made some slabs and fired them. And we took a rubbing, or she took the rubbing up with a wax crayon on this mylar. And here is Toshiko painting over the, the wax resist with Speedo Peg that created a, a kind of resist and she was used this to transfer the texture of her ceramics onto the fabric through a multi-step screen printing process and the background texture for another experimental drapable moon coat. 
this is the pattern piece for the um, coat and I drew with pencil to mark where the, the circles would be placed on the jacket. And here's the prototype being printed with acid dyes on raw silk and the circles are centered down the, the center of the coat, the center of the back and down the arms. Toshiko's residency, we spent hours and days in, uh, mixing color and trying to match the beautiful cobalt glazes of her ceramics. And this was another sample from her artist box. And this last image is a video clip of Toshiko who is kind of summing up her residency and offering words of wisdom of the artistic process. Nothing is simple, and you can read the text that simple. You have to make decisions, what color, what materials, what texture. It's not that simple, and she's learning a lot. I thought I would just make circles, but making decisions, I think, takes a lot of time. Nothing is simple, you know, that simple. <laughs> You know, to make decisions, what colors to fit and what material, what texture. It's not, you know, it's not that simple. So, you, you know, I'm learning a lot. But I thought I can just make circle and just say, and something else. But, you know, making decisions, I think, takes a lot of uh, time. Next, I welcome New York-based artist Shino Takeda to talk about her artistic process. Hi, my name is Shino Takeda. I am born and raised in Japan and currently live and work in Brooklyn. It has been 24 years since I live in New York and it is um, 11th year of making ceramic. Um, my work is pure joy. It's a reflection of my life. What's happening right now around me? How am I feeling? It's based on through the season and the nature. It is like my diary, I would say. Um, it's a, also a celebration and appreciation of the life. I do think my work are just like me, part of me, like part of that work is so Japanese and organic and intuitive. But at the same time, the other half of the side is very New Yorker. It's a mishmash of colors and lines, and you could hear the noises, the how noisy New York is, and you know the experience that you would see in New York is just so much layers of the life. That's I would think it's my work. Um, I do like the idea of functional. I think it's because people can touch it and feel it and use it and also passed on to another generation. Just like my grandfather's antique, I have it. Even though I never met my grandfather, I feel like I'm connected to my grandparents through the ceramic. And I'm hoping the same thing could happen to my work. Also, I do like that idea of the vase or the planter change or the complete with food or the flower that based on whoever you know, get my work. So it could be just a simple vase, but depending on who's gonna put what color of the flower, it would completely change. And I do appreciate that. And also I just think that's just something, it's very romantic about it and sentimental about it. So I do like to stick with my work to be functional, but um, it's been 11th year, as I said, making ceramic and a couple of years ago, I was more interested in making a little more bigger work or installation work. And it's perfect timing. I met Fabric Workshop Museum and I was invited to do the silk screen, which is I wasn't really, <laughs> I wasn't really understand it because I make everything one of the kind of work I'm interested in making. You know, everything is different. And I didn't really get the idea of doing silk screen, same print for over and over. And they recommended to the monoprint, which is much more like my grazing technique. It's very, you know, reaction and the momentum, catching the momentum thing. So it was really, really um, great experience. And it was an opportunity to think about 
outside the box and think bigger and connect it to the two dimensional to three dimensional and then be still my work. And it was just a great exercise for me. Um, I also working on a different technique of the firing, which is uh, you have that picture right now. So majority of my work are uh, electric firing since um, I live in New York in the middle of the city and it makes sense for me to fire in electric firing, which is more color friendly. So, you know, um, it could have pretty much like a painting. I could bring it up the color I want it in my head. And what I'm trying to achieve in my ceramic is that using layer of color and making kind of imperfect perfect also the abstract landscape that people can connect it. Um, that's what I'm trying to achieve for my ceramic. And I am working with the wood firing, which is much more longer process and much more traditional form and more leading up to the nature or the God of the fire, we would always say, which brings up more deeper organic color is more elegant, not too crazy colorful like mine. And also the other hand, the raku firing, which is the short term, like two, two hours firing, which is much about raster and shining and much more for me, it's flat colors, um, but it's really gorgeous and much more like fun colors. So I'm trying to achieve this wood firing and raku firing um, in the kind of same language as my electric firing, but have a more different attitude in a sense, and go out of the tradition of wood firing and go out of the tradition of raku firing and find out something that I could only make it because I live in New York and all the experience comes through the work. Um, that's what I'm really trying to do right now but also have that still have that strong character of the wood firing. If I do the wood firing, I wanna make sure that there is a reason why I did the wood firing, but also people can recognize the work as my electric firing, you know, and the wood firing, the connection. So that's what I'm um, really trying to do, work on it right now. Thank you for the invitation to come talk about uh, Toshiko Tokezu's amazing work today. Um, I'm primarily going to be speaking about her ceramic practice, but I really love that Christina mentioned um, all the amazing work she um, did at the Fabric Workshop Museum during her uh, residency and the exploration of the circle motif, which I will talk about um, a little bit more as well. So. Um, Nisei artist uh, Toshiko Tukezo is one of the most important American studio potters and artists of the 20th and 21st centuries. And while she worked in various media, fiber, paint, and clay, her tendency towards the abstract form and abstract glazes and painting techniques remained constant. She was born in Hawaii to Okinawan parents and belongs to a broader group of Asian American women artists who worked in an abstract mode during the 20th century. Most of these women have been critically overlooked um, in the history of art. So I really welcome the opportunity to discuss her work for uh, many reasons within this group, not the least of which being that fiber and ceramic artists uh, have especially been marginalized within art history, but also in the museum sphere as well. Um, this is even more so the case when it comes to artists of color, like Asian Americans. And then when you're talking about somebody like Toshiko, she faced sort of the threat of triple marginalization as a woman, as an Asian American, and as somebody who worked with clay, which is often thought of um, as a craft material. Uh, at the Cantor Art Center at Stanford, um, I serve as co-director of the Asian American Art Initiative with Professor Marcy Kwan in Art and Art History. And this endeavor aims to establish Stanford and the Cantor as a leading academic and curatorial center for the study of Asian American and Asian diaspora artists. Uh, we are dedicated to the study and artists of artists and makers of Asian descent like Toshiko Takezu. And through targeted acquisitions, we hope to make, or we hope to build uh, one of the preeminent collections of work by Asian American artists uh, in a university art museum. 
and we're you know doing pretty good since uh, 2019 and we've acquired almost 200 works of art by artists of um, Asian descent from the late 19th century to the present day. Um, Toshiko's work has been on my mind as I'm looking to include these works that we have in our collection, um, most of which were given to us by the artist. Uh, in this upcoming exhibition that I'm putting together for fall of 2022 called uh, East of the Pacific, Making Histories of Asian American Art. And this will serve as the launch exhibition for the Asian American Art Initiative at the Cantor. The show asks the following questions. What would it mean to reconsider the history of the West as one of Eastern expansion from Asia um, into the continental United States? And how might we reorient our understanding of what constitutes Asian and what constitutes American art through looking at artists who worked between these worlds? In the show, uh, Takeza's work will be presented in a section featuring Asian American women abstractionists who worked in different media. Um, in this slide, I've paired her with Bernice Bing, the, a work by Bernice Bing, Chinese American painter who rose to prominence in the 50s and 60s within and among a group of Bay Area artists, uh, which included Jay DeFeo, Bruce Connor, and Joan Brown. Uh, Bing studied at both uh, CCA uh, and um, SFAI, San Francisco Art Institute, where uh, Richard Diebenkorn, Saburo Hasegawa, and Elmer Bischoff counted among her mentors and teachers. Um, like Takezu, Bing, or Bingo, as she was known to her friends, was heavily influenced in her artistic practice um, by her study of Zen Buddhism and her own exploration of her heritage through the medium of Chinese calligraphy. Both of these artists used their chosen primary media, paint and clay, to generate new modes of syncretic image making that reference their experiences as members of the Asian diaspora. Uh, besides being a painter, Bingo also served as caretaker for the Mayakamas Vineyard up um, north of San Francisco and was the first executive director of Soma Arts, a historically important community arts center in San Francisco. Um, I bring up these last two aspects of Bingo's career because I want us to think about what artists do beyond creating objects and how they create their own lives. Too often art historians um, are hyper-focused on individual artworks like these beautiful artworks that we're looking at today at the expense of the bigger picture or sometimes just overlooking the bigger picture. You know, how did these women organize their time? How did their practices intersect with community building? And even what did their home spaces look like? Um, and there's a picture of young um, Bernice Bing. Uh, while more work needs to be, oops, while more work needs to be done for Bingo to take her rightful place in art history, um, by the way, Stanford uh, Special Collections acquired her archive in concert with the painting that was acquired by the Cantor. So there's lots more work to be done and you can do it uh, at Stanford. Uh, the next artist that I want to think about alongside Takesu's practice is Ruth Asawa, who is perhaps one of the best known Asian American uh, artists of the 20th century. Both Takesu and Asawa were thoughtful explorers of artistic economy. Asawa's exploration of line in space runs parallel to Takesu's interest in the closed form shape. Both of these artists dealt with the problem of categorization during their lifetimes. Um, Asawa was often classified as a housewife who uh, made decorative objects and not abstract sculptures. Um, and as often the case for those who work in clay, Takezu worked between functional forms um, and non-utilitarian works, most notably with these closed form vessels like the one that you see on the right. Uh, with these works, Takezu would throw or build her forms and leave the smallest possible opening at the top um, which you can sort of see here in this almost like pinched uh, nipple-like shape as she would often describe it, so that the object could still be classified as a vessel, which is of course one of the oldest ceramic forms. Inside she would also place a rolled ball of clay that was wrapped inside um, paper, which would of course burn away during the firing process, so that after it was fired the ball would remain inside, and so this vessel also served um, as a rattle. If you, it makes a sound if you're able to move it. So I love looking at their work together. Asawa's sculptures are about transparency. You can see 
through, around, and look directly at her sculptures. They occupy space not only in their physical form, but in the amazing shadows that they create on the wall when you see them installed. Um, while Takezus are about surface and interiority, um, there's so much going on um, on the surface in terms of what she does with her glaze work that's really uh, stunning. But then you also realize that this form is so close, you really can't see um, its interior. And you know, if you know her practice, that her objects make sound, but you don't have access to that sound either. Unless, of course, um, you have an art handler and work inside of a museum and they can move the object for you. But for most, for the most part, most viewers are not going to experience that aspect of her work. Um, and of course, with the both of them, they are really working with repetition. This is something that Asawa learned um, from Joseph Albers, her mentor. Um, and I think that there's something really beautiful and wonderful in thinking about artists who place specific limitations on themselves. Uh, you know, what happens if I lim limit myself to just working with a single piece of wire, for instance, or just to working and dealing with the vessel form? You know, as women artists working in the 20th century, I think it's pretty safe to say that they were well acquainted with the idea of limitations. And most of the, of the time, these limitations were placed on them by other people. But I love that in this realm, they are taking control and setting their own parameters and showing that limitations can be their own kind of freedom and form of artistic expression. Um, the relationship between um, and the impact that artists of Asian descent have had on the history of abstraction is you know, well known and explored elsewhere. I just wanted to touch on it briefly here. Um, notably it, uh, in the 2018 exhibition, Abstract Expressionism, Looking East from the Far West, which happened in Hawaii at the Honolulu Museum of Art, which Takezu's work was featured in. Um, and I think it's of course vitally important that we understand and acknowledge the contributions of underrepresented makers to the history of abstraction. But I'm also interested in thinking further than this and looking at their practices from a comprehensive perspective and thinking about who they were as women, um, and how they led rich, complex lives where art and all its forms took center stage. Um, what I love is with all of them, they viewed artistic practice in a non-hierarchical but essential way, a natural extension of who they were as thinkers, makers, and caretakers. And I just absolutely love this quote by Takezio, where she says, in my life, I see no difference between making pots, cooking, and growing vegetables. They are also related. However, there is a need for me to work in clay. It is so gratifying and I get so much joy for it and it gives me many answers in my life. So I just wanted to end in looking at the space um, that Toshiko lived and worked um, because it reminds me of my own work and thinking about the life of Ruth Asawa, who was also um, someone who turned her living space into an incredible work of art, an immersive environment where she would host wonderful dinners and um, invite her community in and uh, work with students. Both of these artists were great teachers to hundreds and hundreds of people at Takezio at Princeton um, and Asawa in her various roles as an arts advocate in the Bay Area. And actually Asawa worked with ceramics as well in a manner in which um, is not as well known, but she uh, over the course of 40 years created ceramic masks um, from plaster casts of her friends, family, students and community members. And she literally hung these on the outside of her home. Um, and the Cantor recently acquired this wall of 233 masks and we will be installing it in July of next year. Another thing that I love about the both of them is that they were avid gardeners. And I know, Christina, you mentioned having experience, um, which I have not had, the, you know, did not have the privilege of having this experience. But I love thinking about, you know, these Asian American women like Bernie Sping, who, like I said, took care of a vineyard, who were teachers, who took care of land, who grew things, who believed in the power of making food and making art and inviting your community in. And so I really think it's important to think about the totality of these women and um, how it's just as important as Toshiko said, to think about uh, the importance of growing your own food and tending to land and uh, making art as not necessarily having a boundary that all of this counts um, in terms of artistic practice. I just wanted to start because I didn't, I learned from your presentation 
as you said, the totality of an artist and the kind of link between hospitality and um, ceramics. And I wanted, you know, to just to kind of connect that dot for us as well, because that does relate to the way in which you came into ceramics as well. Is that true? Yeah, well, um, so I didn't study ceramic to, I mean, I didn't even study, actually, I shouldn't say I studied, I started 11 years ago, but I was familiar with ceramic material because uh, it's our part of the family tradition that my mom would, my mom is like love cooking. So we always have a guest, my father's, you know, like employee or whatever, you know, all those young people always come to my parents' house and we always have a big meal, even though it's only four of us, we have like at least 10 dishes every mm-hmm. night. And what they do is when I was growing up, not after I was junior high school, but you know, when I was elementary school, my mom would be like, okay, today's meal is this and this and this and this. And me and my big sister, we are allowed to pick the plates because uh, my mom had a lot of antiques or vintage or like, you know, we used to go to ceramic studio to pick some plates to buy from artists straight. So I grew up in that kind of a, um, experience and I could totally connect it to the Toshiko. Um, it's all just connected. And, you know, that's, I was familiar with the material because of the reason, you know, so I could totally um, relate to that. And I actually do the same thing now, you know, I love having friends over and of course I end up using my plates and, you know, it's just a part of, it's it's complete your practice in a sense and many people knows customer knows but i even use the plates before i sell it because i wanted to see how i feel you know so i know it feels right to use it and stuff so yeah i think totally relate that (laughs) i just thank you i just want to connect that to to christina roberts because um, it was not mentioned in your presentation, but Toshiko Takeizu's residency was one of the first residencies that you worked on as a new studio coordinator at the Fabric Workshop. One of well, the first, if that's right. And thinking about uh, the way that you live your life in terms of hospitality and gardening and everything being connected, I wondered if there's been any as a studio coordinator working with an artist in residence, are there any things that you, anything that you've taken from that residency that you still continue on in your role, the fabric workshop 20 years later? (laughs) Yeah, a long time, maybe 30. (laughs) It's been quite a long time, but it certainly was an honor. My father knew Toshiko and I had met her a few times when I was in my youth. And when I just started working at the fabric workshop, um, Toshiko was invited to be a resident and she was coming in July and I had just started in May. (laughs) And typically like printers, you know, work a couple years before they start working on an artist project. And so when Kippy saw that I knew Toshiko and she remembered me, you know, and we were talking, she's like, you can be her project coordinator. (laughs) So um, I was pretty green and uh, didn't really know what I was doing. But, you know, I had just uh, gotten my BFA from Moore College of Art and knew about printing. And I had been an apprentice at the fabric workshop. So I was pretty familiar with the place. But I think working with an artist like Toshiko taught me a lot because um, yeah, she was the hospitality and the warmth that she had, you know, just immediately, you know, she's like an art star, but I, you know, really felt at ease and she loved everything, which was sort of tricky because, you know, when you're trying to like make decisions and like really make something that that's, you know, important to their work and integral to their work, um, you don't want to stray too far. but. I was so green that everybody was telling me what to do and like trying all these different things. But if I had just listened to Toshiko, I think she came to that residency with those prints and that's what she wanted to make. And we probably could have been done that day. (laughs) You know, like we probably could have just made those and she would have been happy. And the Mid-Atlantic Arts Foundation grant that we got for $2,250, you know, we would have been done with it. But I, I, I do think that she loved community and, you know, she really wanted to welcome us to her home in Quakertown um, and yeah, to show us her garden. I still remember like all the vegetables that she grew. I had never seen anything as beautiful in my life. And then she cooked them and cooked this incredible meal that we ate on her ceramics. And 
Yeah, her house was filled with much like yours, you know, <laughs> art <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> and yeah, and we saw those beautiful photos um, that you shared, Elisa, of her home. And yeah, it was a really special moment and just spending the day in her studio. I think we made a few trips um, back and forth to her studio and she always welcomed us with hospitality and food. And um, yeah, she was incredible. And she came back and forth to the workshop. So I really learned a lot, how to listen, how to yield, how to pay attention to even nonverbal signs of, you know, <laughs> you know, like something, but there might be something in the body language that says, you know, maybe not that color or, mm -hmm. or something. Yeah. I think that's interesting to think about those cues because in a residency of the fabric workshop, the artists are invited to try something new and usually something they've not done before. So it's really, you really do have to pick up on those nonverbal cues because sometimes it's, it puts you in a vulnerable position to say, I have no idea what I'm doing, <laughs> you know? And so if you just kind of, if there's a lot of humming and hawing, I think the Fabric Workshop crew have gotten used to like, how about we try this over here instead, you know? And <laughs> we can turn corners easily now, learn from you on that for sure. Um, and so I, at least I wanted to um, turn it over to you to talk about this. It's relatively new um, initiative um, that you've started, you're a co-director of, and I thought we would, spend some time learning about it, but as an end and you sharing what you're working on, what it means, um, and then what it takes to build an initiative like this, if you could share, that'd be great. Sure. So um, I started at the Cantor in September of 2018. And so I've been working on this the whole time that I've been here. Marcy Kwan had had the idea um, prior to my arrival, but you know she needed a curatorial counterpart in order to build an initiative like this beyond the academic research realm and to take it into the physical museum space. So I was really excited about um, working on this project, even though it was not my area of study in graduate school, but um, you know, an interesting and meaningful pivot for myself um, as an Asian American um, and Americanist. Uh, it was something that seemed especially relevant living and working in the Bay Area, which is just so deeply Asian American. And it makes me feel like I couldn't live anywhere else, you know, because it's like, how could I ever live anywhere else? I live like five minutes from an Asian grocery store. Anyway, <laughs> um, side note. Uh, and so we have been working on this the whole time that I've been here, but it didn't formally launch. We didn't, you know, release any press about it until earlier this year, because what we wanted to do was to make sure that we had some of the materials in place in house already. So. Like I mentioned, we started building a collection because that is, you know, you need the raw material to work with. And, you know, we had some works like these Takeyezu pieces. They were already in the collection um, before my arrival, but there was no systematic focus or emphasis on um, Asian American art. So we were just like, what would it mean to devote our time, resources and energy um, specifically and very deliberately towards the preservation and long-term care of work by um, Asian Americans. And so um, Marcy does the research um, academic component within Stanford. And, you know, of course I feel very much like it has to be at a place like Stanford at a university that has the ability to collect archives in addition to collecting works of art as you know, archives and um, artist materials like that are of really great interest, um, as well as having a museum where we can uh, collect the actual objects themselves. So that's the, you know, that's the main thing is right now really focusing on bringing that material together. And then um, next year is when a lot of these things will begin to go on display, like our um, semi-permanent installation of the Asawa mask wall, which will be opening in July. And then we have a couple of um, exhibitions that are collection-based uh, shows um, based on the acquisitions that we've made uh, that will open in September of next year. And then, you know, this is a long-term game that I hope eventually we can establish a permanent space at the Cantor where Asian American art is always on view um, to really create spaces and opportunities for encounter that, for example, I never had um, growing up or Marcy didn't either when we would walk into museums and, you know, going into a space or a gallery and only, and then only featuring work by um, makers from the Asian diaspora. So 
it comes from a place for both of us of wanting to provide opportunities that were not available and we're not that old okay like it should have been available when we were in school um and you know stanford is full of so many amazing precocious students and the reception that we've already got from the student body um as well as the community has been really incredible they the students want it they want to see themselves represented and also if you're just interested in art and history and american art and contemporary art like this is very relevant so um stay tuned and check in next year um when this will finally take some public form well, congratulations. I, we only know that from what you're telling us, but we also know that there's so much that goes behind the scenes and so many conversations and, and back and forth that happens to build, to start something new within an organ, within an institution as well. So it's amazing. Absolutely. You know, it takes a, takes a village <laughs> to make these things happen. It really does. Work. Yeah. The good work. Yeah. Good work. You know, I also wanted to mark that this was uh, I think, um, Elisa, you touched on this idea that ceramicists work both in the idea of production and in kind of artworks. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about this exhibition at the Fabric Workshop was a really important turning point for you too, to move a little bit from production to museum artwork. So what does that feel like? And and what did, did. And like thinking about what Toshiko said, like, it's really about decisions. You can make circles, but what are the decisions that you made? And so I wanted to know if you could share, did you make different types of decisions and this time being your first kind of museum experience um, with your ceramics? Um, yes and no, I think. I mean, it's obviously without you, I really couldn't make it this far. <laughs> She helped me, like, you know, Karen helped me like 100%. And, you know, I felt really comfortable, you know, but you know, like me, it's like super easy going, like sometimes too easy going. And I think Toshiko said that, you know, that word that making decision is, you know, a lot. And then that kind of like, you know, wake me up because for me making decision, I didn't even have to make a decision. You know, I just felt whatever I feel like, whatever I want to. And even this show, um, you allow me to do that. So in a way, Yes, I was working on a bigger um, picture and also it was a little more backwards in a sense that how I approached the way. Because usually um, every my pieces, uh, when I'm making shapes, I don't really think, I'll just make shape a bunch of it. And when the time has come, the glazing, the coloring time, that's the time it really focus and I immerse my sense to entire you know, what's happening around me and that everything is about glazing. So until the moment, I don't make any decisions and I would usually have 50 pieces on a table and I would just like start coloring like crazy. And then the last minute, I would just start like making balance a little bit. Okay, this is too much red. So what, what color I want to bring it up? But I don't really have a philosophy or anything in the back. I just make it because I think it's beautiful. It reminds me of something ocean that I never been in this year or, you know, everything is about my experience. But in this particular um, public workshop and museum project, it started from one silk screen and, you know, from it was just long story short, I got so lucky and I had a two installation that I can join to. One was to, you know, with the other artists. And the one my installation is supposed to not happen, but it just happened naturally and I it just fall into my luck. And you know, I had this silk screen that I made, and then using that I could create some installation pieces. It's almost in the going backwards. I have this picture and what can I do with this silk screen? And the silk screen has this ton of little um, pots that, you know, the silk screen. And then how can I make this two dimensional, two, three dimensional, you know, just thinking about backwards, it allows me to exercise my brain a little bit. Mm -hmm. But when I had this, um, opportunity from you I had this just like right away I had this picture came up like what if the little tiny 50 60 little tiny pot coming out from the silk screen so it was very very um intuitive in a sense because I had the idea right away 
and I just have to work with around it, you know, to make it a little more interesting and a little more, you know, um, more universe kind of, you know, making space much more bigger, seeing a little bit from a little bit outside the box and trying to see my world instead of like seeing in front of my world, you know? Yeah, so, yeah it was a we can, show, we can show some images of your, um, when we edit the video, we can show some images of your beautiful installation. <laughs> gorgeous, yeah, like between your world, that's a good way to describe it. <laughs> there are some so, Toshiko moons, a tribute to the moons in your oh installation. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was really, 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 um, it was honor to see that, you know, her piece is like that because I didn't see her work before in hand. And it just happened to be like, you know, similar moon I was thinking. I mean, she was thinking moon and I was more thinking the planets, you know, so Jupiter mm -hmm. and all those, you know, what is the planet was like falling from the top or something. But it just, you know, because I admire her work and I even tried to um, apply for the residency for the hair shop, <laughs> but then it's the pandemic happened. So, you know, it was just like I knew her work and it was just so exciting to see it. And, you know, just even think about a little bit. That, oh, we shared a little mind. You know, it's, it's, it's just a good feeling, you know. That's incredible. There's one really wonderful story about Toshiko that I'd love to share. And, uh, you know, she loved the moon and her work was about moon balls. And, you know, she's always thinking about the moon. But one night she was driving in Quakertown, which is a very rural area in New Jersey. And it was nighttime and the moon was bright, so bright that she had the headlights off on her vehicle that she was driving. And she was driving down this country road, no headlights. And a police car came up behind her and stopped her. But of course, Toshiko was just so Toshiko and just so lovely. She charmed the, this New Jersey police officer. And he said, ma'am, you're driving without your headlights on. And she said, but look up, look at the moon. It's so beautiful. I, I, I can't possibly have my headlights on. And the police officer like looked up and he was like, okay, well, I'll follow you home so you get home safely. <laughs> He didn't arrest her. So, oh, yeah. I thought that was such a great story. That's amazing. Wow. <laughs> she was a real charmer. Mm, I could see that. <laughs> Do you all have questions for each other that you wanted to, that after we've seen each other in our presentations, we have just a couple minutes left. If anyone wanted to share some insights or ask each other questions, we have some time for that. I don't I have a million questions, but yeah. I'm just so honored to, to be here with all of you and so appreciative of your time. I learned so much and want to know more and I want to follow Cantor and see <laughs> how your work progresses and want to follow Shino's work and buy some of your ceramics. They're so beautiful. <laughs> Absolutely. Same to that, you know. <laughs> uh, no, I feel similarly and I, I just am... Uh, wonderful curation of uh, talks because I think we all just talk to each other really nicely and Christina it was so wonderful to hear about your experiences with the artist um, firsthand uh, how special of an experience um, that is and then you know being able to be put in conversation with her work directly is um, so cool and I wish I could see the show in person. You know well we will send you lots of photos because it is they are um, they well she know and took toshiko in my mind the way that the exhibition is they are in kind of work <laughs> of each other they're across the room just slightly diagonally from each other and toshiko's moons are on the ground and then she knows they're coming from the sky <laughs> and it just feels like they're in conversation with each other and the rest of us are just like the policeman <laughs> so i just like yeah this is i can see it now. i get it yeah <laughs> It's a beautiful show and Karen, you did such an incredible job curating it. And I have to say that, you know, I hadn't seen the moon balls, um, the soft moon since I made them in the eighties. So to see them, you know, when it was all installed, I did cry, <laughs> so, oh my God. And, you know, uh, Karen uh, curated the show with that beautiful woven uh, carpet in the background with that cobalt blue. That was one of Toshiko's weaving. She had a, a loom in her home. 
and just to see them uh, with nestled next to the the moons and the soft moons in you know the prints from Penland um, it's really a beautiful installation and yeah, I guess all good things come with time, right? <laughs> I think it was time to have Toshiko's show. And, you know, and then get to see Sorry, yeah. them with uh, Shino's tiny moons. <laughs> it's really beautiful. Yeah, this conversation just is a good reminder of how much self-reflection is available to making, you know, and I even though... Um, the show was really about screen printing and ceramics and their relationship. It also feels now after seeing the work together and hearing Shino talk and also hearing your research, Elisa, and your experiences, Christina, that there's so much more that happens than, than and thinking about the totality, as you said, that there's something that gets crystallized when you're in the space with processes and, and, and the mechanics of a kiln or the or the screen printing and the and the firing and all these kinds of things keep you present in the moment and you can see that in the work and um it does it, it did feel like a much more um magnetic show when you see all the works together um then you think about them on a checklist you know yeah yeah Absolutely. I, um, of course, I wanted to accept this invitation because I love Toshiko's work, but I also think, and I sort of formatted my talk around it, that I really, there's all these like wonderful Asian American women in particular who like model a really wonderful way of like living life. And so like, I just wanted to like talk about that as well, because I think that they really show like what a rich and full life filled with art can be and it encompasses so many things. And so, um, that was definitely a draw um, to it as well. So I'm glad that you're going to end with um, images of her studio. Yes, exactly. Speaking of the totality of life, I think uh, I thank you for all for bringing your perspectives onto this work. And we should end with um, Toshiko's beautiful space in Quaker Town. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.